Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And my name is Liz. Welcome to Art at Home. I want to first thank the Hoboken Public Library for allowing us to have these wonderful classes where we can do art from the comfort of our own home during this time of COVID. It's just a miraculous thing that we've had this lifeline to each other and to our creativity in this time of isolation. So a few ground rules. Please remember to mute yourself uh, during class. If you have any thoughts, ideas, or comments, you are welcome as always to unmute and say what you need to say. But at this point in time, I'm going to ask you to put your mic on mute. I hope that everyone had a wonderful holiday weekend. I know that some of you are still in the holiday season, and I hope that your holiday celebrations are still going well. All right, again, I'm requesting that everyone put your mic on mute and we are gonna begin. We are in the month of April, which in the United States is National Poetry Month. And I have chosen for us today, an artist who is incredibly influenced by poetry. His name is Cy C.Y. Twombly. And I learned, I didn't even know this, that his first name, Cy, is a nickname. His father was a professional baseball player and he had also the nickname Cy. And Cy Twombly, the artist, his son, also acquired the same nickname of Cy. I don't know what Cy stands for, how they got the nickname Cy, but his father pitched for the Chicago White Sox. Oh, sorry, they were nicknamed after the baseball great Cy Young, who, who pitched for the Cardinals, the Red Sox, the Indians, and the Braves. So for those of you who are concerned or anxious or worried about how Cy Twombly got his name, that's how he got his name. Not very poetic, but hey. So his real name is Edwin Parker Twombly Jr. He was born April 25th, 1928. And he died fairly recently, July 5th, 2011. He was an American sculptor, painter, and photographer. And he was part of the generation that included American greats like Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns. He influenced younger artists such as Anselm Kiefer and Francesco Clementi and the very infamous and famous Julian Schnabel. Schnabel is also a great filmmaker. He has done a fabulous film about one of my other favorite artists, Jean-Michel Basquiat, which I recommend highly, and I think you should look it up and watch it if you can. Twombly is most famous for his abstract paintings. They are literally scribbled works of art. They are very calligraphic and graffiti-like works. They're on usually gray and tan or off-white backgrounds, and they're very quick, fast, line, rapid drawings. He loved ancient Greek and Roman mythology. In fact, he was very drawn to cultures, um, particularly cultures from countries that he either lived or traveled in. He was, as I mentioned, 
very much influenced by poets, including Mallarmé, Rainer Maria Rilke, and John Keats. Again, he loved ancient myths and allegories. And he has a series of eight drawings that consist solely of the word Virgil. And they're wonderful. His works are in the permanent collection of modern art museums around the world, including the Menil Collection in Houston, the Tate Modern in London, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and Munich's Museum Brandhorst. He was commissioned for a ceiling at the Musée de Louvre in Paris. And here's a great quote about his work from the curator Kirk Varnado. He described Twombly's work as influential among artists, discomforting to many critics, and truculently difficult, not just for a broad public but for sophisticated initiates of post-war art as well. So you might find his work difficult to understand. Again, we're going to be up against that big question, what is art? But I think, I hope that you're gonna enjoy looking at the images of his work. A few other interesting facts about his life. He studied at the Art Students League of New York, which is where he met Rauschenberg. Uh, they had a sexual relationship. Rauschenberg encouraged him to attend Black Mountain College in Asheville, North Carolina, which was a school that produced many great 20th century artists. He studied there with Franz Klein, Robert Motherwell and Ben Shahn, and he also met the composer John Cage there. The poet and rector of the college, Charles Olson, had a great influence on him as well. Robert Motherwell arranged for Twombly's first solo exhibition at the Samuel Coutts Gallery in New York in 1951. And at that point, his work was influenced by Klein's black and white gestural expressionism, as well as Paul Clay's imagery. He, in 1952, received a grant from the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. And this really, this grant enabled him to take a trip that influenced his art tremendously for the rest of his life. It enabled him to travel to North Africa, Spain, Italy, and France. He traveled with Rauschenberg and he saw art from different cultures. And this really sparked in him a love for the aesthetic of a variety of art from around the world. And it really, really influenced his own work. He then married in 1957. He moved to Rome and married the artist Tatiana Franchetti. Um, they bought a palazzo in Rome. They had a villa. They had a son named Cyrus. He met another woman, Nicola del Rossio and she became his longtime companion. Twombly and Tatiana never divorced, however, and remained friends, lifelong friends. She died a year before him, and then he died from cancer in 2011. He served in the US Army as a cryptologist, and he became a prominent figure, as I mentioned, alongside Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns in the emerging New York arts community movement from 1955 to 1959. He became fascinated with tribal art in the early 1950s and developed a technique, this technique of gestural drawing characterized by thin lines on dark canvases. 
All right. He often inscribed on his paintings the names of mythological figures during the 1960s. He painted the rape of Lita by the god Zeus in the form of a swan six times, once in 1960, twice in 1962. And in 64, there was an exhibition of a nine panel discourses on Commodus at the Leo Castelli Gallery in New York. And I think that's plenty of information about his career. Oh, but let me read this information because I love this. So bear with me for just a couple more minutes of art historical information. Cy Twombly's work can be understood as one vast engagement with cultural memory. I love that phrase, cultural memory. His paintings, drawings, and sculptures on mythological subjects have come to form a significant part of that memory. Usually drawing on the most familiar gods and heroes, he restricts himself to just a few relatively well-known episodes as narrated by poet historians, given visible shape by artists and repeatedly reinterpreted in the literature and visual art of later centuries. His special medium is writing. Starting out from purely graphic marks, he developed a kind of meta script in which abbreviated signs, hatching loops, numbers, and the simplest of pictographs spread throughout the picture plane in a process of incessant movement, repeatedly subverted by erasures. Eventually, this metamorphosed into script itself. So frequently his work was condemned and criticized with comments like, well, my kid could do stuff like that. But I think when you look at his work, you're gonna see a lot more thought and consideration behind what he does. And my response, whenever I hear comments like that about abstract works of art is, but they did it. Twombly did do it after much thought and observation of art that he viewed in other parts of the world. So let's see what he created. Any comments or thoughts before we start looking at his images? No? Okay. Let me just open some of these pictures that I have. I have a lot to look at. He is one of my personal favorites. I'm gonna say that right up front. I have always admired Twombly's work. I almost got to meet him once. I went to an opening of his work in Warhol, which would, to me always seemed like an odd combination of artists. The show was beautiful. Warhol was there. I didn't get to meet him at that point. Um, and I didn't get, Twombly never showed up for the opening, so I didn't get to meet him. <laughs> Oops, teeny tiny. Let's see if I can enlarge it. Everybody able to see this? If somebody could give me a thumbs up. That would be nice. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. Yes. All right, so you can see it does look like a bunch of scribbles and it's done very quickly. It appears to be a rush job, but I believe Twombly took a lot of time deciding where he put things, how he placed things in his composition, what colors he used, why did he put this 
funny protruding shape here and not over here, for example, the artist had to have been making deliberate decisions about placements of colors, shapes, and lines. And all of these lines meant something to him. They were either part of this language that he invented, or they were just a love for lines and calligraphic markings. Anybody want to talk about whether they like it or not? Talk about aesthetically. Do you like the colors, lines, shapes, placement of form, those kinds of I have a, I also have a question, Liz. It's Jane. Ed. Yep. So um I you you said uh, language he invented. Could you explain what you meant by that? No. <laughs> oh, okay. I cannot, but he so if you, if you were able to hear the description of his work that yeah. I just read, it talks about how the markings that he created eventually evolved into a script or a language. His special huh. medium is writing. Starting okay. from purely graphic marks, he developed a kind of meta script in which abbreviated signs, and this is good, this is worth rereading while you're looking at the image. Thank you. He developed a kind of meta script in which abbreviated signs, hatching, loops, numbers, and the simplest of pictographs spread throughout the picture plane in a process of incessant movement. Repeat. Ah, okay, well that, yeah. So thank you for rereading. It really is more, uh, clear to me while viewing. Um, and as to comments about this work, I, I do like it very much. I think there's something, um, it, it makes me think of fabric actually. Like I'd imagine if, if this were presented as, as fabric, one wouldn't be questioning it as much. Um, as he might have been questioned in his day, but um, but I really like the softness of the characters. It gives you some freedom, and it it's clear to me that the this particular image moves from um, left to right. Huh. Why? I just see that you know everybody's kind of bending in that direction. Okay. And then as you, you know, you observed like the figures that are moving off the page, they're mostly, they're accumulating on the, on the right. I Almost like you're watching a visual. Figurative. I just love, love, love that you see the dashes and stuff is figurative. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. I love the movement and it feels so gestural and there's so much movement and it feels very controlled to me, Liz, and not just like anybody could do this. It's very, um, you can see this as a total composition in terms of gesture movement, where everything is placed and how everything relates to each other. I think it's quite fabulous, personally. All right, thank you both, Jean and Suzanne. Any like this. Does it say what size this is? I looked up some oh. of his paintings and they were huge, which yes. involved They're so much mammoth. physicality. Yes, they are mammoth, a la Jackson Pollock. They are, you know, wall size pieces. They're huge. The physicality of them yes. in terms of when, when you see that size becomes so much more obvious of what it would yes. take physically to do that. Thank you for mentioning that, Teresa. They, they are enormous. They probably took him months to create particularly since he constantly erased and added, took away, eliminated, then added again. And he was always making changes to his work. As opposed to someone like Pollock, who was, you know, an action painter, he would put it down, cover it up, put it down, cover it up. 
he would make his paintings very rapidly and then move away from them. But Twombly was constantly revisiting and changing his work. I like the color combinations. Great, Margo, me too. Very warm. I find this painting very warm and inviting and it's fun. Don't you see it as kind of fun? It's playful. Yeah, it's kind of celebratory and... Yeah, it kind of dances. Yes. And I, not I noticed the absence of green. Huh. Yeah, I mean, green wasn't on his mind. I yep. think the ochre and the red are such an interesting combination. I mean, and not one you'd necessarily think of together, but that pairing that then makes there's going into the rows kind of in the middle with a different kind of scribble and then- And the, then the touches of blue. How interesting yeah. this blue outline is here and then this blue drip and little bits of light blue throughout, grayish blue. That was gray. Yeah. So this one for me kind of harkens back to kind of cave art and maybe ancient Greek and Roman carvings he might have seen, perhaps wall art that he saw in North Africa. So there's also that kind of cross-cultural aesthetic to it that draws me in. All right, so let's look at a few more. Let's see. <clears throat> we'll look at this one next. This is more of the kinds of things that cause controversy for Twombly. I'll do it, John, just in the... He also used a scratching technique in his work, frequently used gray backgrounds with chalk markings like this. These are some of my favorite. But you can see that these are more calligraphic. You can see numbers. You can see things that look like letters and words. Um, I love the kind of explosive movement this has from the middle out to the corners. Let's Did he entitle it. his work? Did he what? Did he put a title on, on any of his work? They're all titled. Um, they all refer to mythology usually, um, but I don't have the titles for these pieces, sorry. I, I do apologize, folks. I just don't have time in the course of my week to do the kind of art history. Like if you take, I really highly recommend Dina Jurassic's classes because they are completely devoted to art historical approach to art. But I, my main goal is to get you guys inspired to do your own artwork. But go look at Cy Twombly's work online and you can find information about his titles. Yeah, he does definitely title all his work because he is inspired by mythology and poetry. The titles are very important to his work. So I'm glad you asked that question. I don't have the title information for you today, forgive me. Okay, look at this one. So this one to me looks like a drawing, looks like it might've been done with oil pastel. That I love, really inspiring. It's awesome. Yeah. I'm gonna just scroll through a bunch of pictures quickly now and do like Jane just did. If you have comments to make, please feel free. Yeah. 
If you can put that first one up again at some point, I'd like to capture it. Sure. I can do that next, Margo. Okay, thanks. Love this one. Definitely looks like flowers, but I can't be positive. So extraordinary compositional choices here. The fact that these are more solid and then there's this scribbly one over to the right maintains our interest. The light lines in some of these and then all the dripping action just makes a beautiful textural effect. Okay, Margo, we're gonna go back to number one. Oops. Try again. No, I've had this problem in the past. It's not letting me do that. Sorry, Margo. Okay. Um, maybe what I have to do, wait, let's try this. Nope. This is not interesting. Let's try moving on to a completely different one and then maybe I can go back. This one is similar, Margot, to the first one. It's in a similar vein. Let's see if I can do that. So it's not the same, Margot, but it's a similar color palette, although yeah. there is there is some green, green in this one, interestingly enough. It's that same kind of jumpy, dancey movement activity. This time going to the left. <laughs> right, this one seems to be tumbling down from this red form. I did like that other one better. Let's see if we can go back to it now. Oops. Here we go. Number one. Yeah. Oh, you took a picture. I got it. <laughs> Good. I, I want to look at a few more. I want you to see the incredible variety um, in his work and what you can do with lines and drippy paint. Not to be spoiler alert, but we are going to do abstraction today. So I want you to see the, the breadth and depth of what you can do with abstraction. Look at this one. Limited color, but you can see the calligraphic graffiti approach in this one. Definitely the letter H, it looks like the letter E and L. Lots of drippage. Like this one. I like the way the bright whites are in the front and it gets grayer as it recedes into space. 
so it gives it a, an illusion of depth very rich and it has a dark it has background. a background like a triptych yes i believe this is three panels you can see the break so this one is probably really big and he worked in oils as well as acrylics so you can get this drippy feel with acryl with oils. You just thin it with a lot of linseed and terps. Franz Klein and Rauschenberg, they all did that drippy stuff. Here's a colorful one. Oh, you're gonna like this one. Anyone who's still on the fence, I think about Twombly, this one might change your mind. I hope. What do you think? Very spring-like. I love red, so it works for me. <laughs> yeah. Was the drip yeah, it's an art? You know, for these artists, Rauschenberg, et cetera, that you said all tried this drippy thing. Is that a phase? Well, you know, they were growing out of the abstract expressionist movement. They were fighting against it. They were trying to move on from people like Jackson Pollock, but they were heavily influenced. It was still the big money maker in the New York art scene. Um, but they, do you think that's a large scale? This piece, yeah, probably. All of his work was big. Is this pastel? I believe this is a painting. It does painting. have that pastel -y feel to it, though, doesn't it? It does. But Jane, back to your question, they were still kind of married to the dripping and the globbing and the, you know, it was such a heavy influence on, on their training that they weren't ready yet to completely break away from it. They were adding collage and assemblage. They were slowly breaking away from, from the rules of abstract expressionism and yet they were still actively engaged so that wasn't my that what somebody else had had mentioned that point but thank you liz i i had a different question that you may choose not to answer it today it was margo's question go ahead Jane. okay so um speaking about scale and executing on a large scale uh-huh um i just wondered if you could comment on on your work where you know, when I saw your exhibit, I was introduced to this, you know, to the very large scale. And I just wondered how, how you approach that sort of thing. Like, just, do you see it at, at its scale or do you, do you create at the, at a smaller scale and then magnify in your, in your planning? I work from small sketches and yes expand that, got it that's my style i yeah i don't know how twombly i don't know what his process was right but when i work from small scale and expand the image changes i mean it has to yeah i don't i'm not the kind of person who imposes like a grid on top of my small sketch and then puts the same right. grid on the canvas and tries to enlarge it exactly the way it was on the small piece of paper. But there are yeah. who do work that way, but that's not the way I do it. I'm inspired by a small sketch and then I begin by trying to recreate it on a larger scale, but tends to change and morph into something new and different on a yeah scale. well this one is my favorite i just love it i can imagine like standing 
in its shadow and wanting to just wrap myself up in the canvas or something. Like, you know? Nice. Nice. Yeah, it's just really beautiful, saturated color. It has his kind of signature explosive movement and action. What's not to like in this? It, it's reminiscent of a thing. It has a very flower-like or tree-like quality to it so we can relate to it on an intellectual level as well. Not quite sure what it, it is. Is he referencing a flower? I don't know. Does it matter to me? Not really. Okay, what time is it? Let's look at one or two more images. Again, I want you to just see the types of things that can be accomplished with abstraction. And this is abstraction though with a difference. He's starting with a conceptual idea. He's inspired by poetry and mythology. There's a story behind the images that he creates. Love this one. See, this, this kind of work really speaks to me because I can see Perhaps he was looking at cave art or ancient sculpture, something, this. Oh yeah, that makes sense in terms of your work, my goodness. Yeah. I love the line quality, the textural effects that he achieves. It's very cool to me that this shape on the left-hand side of the image is incomplete, that it runs off the edge of the paper. very I'm left wondering what the heck am I looking at and I like that I like enigma in art I like questioning thinking about what I'm looking at all right I want to end with one of his colorful ones and then I'm going to tell you what your assignment is for today I believe there's actually a figure in this one. Or figures. You can see the shape of a boat here. This one does refer to an ancient myth. Unfortunately, I don't have the title. I love it. <laughs> Why, Margo? Tell us why. Well, the nautical thing and all the colors and the way the drips are not just vertical. Yeah, they go every which way. Yeah. And, yeah, which what makes it seem like it's moving. Yes, and the way, it, the way the boat is emerging from this stuff on the right into the clearing, that's what creates the movement. Because you can see it's moving from one state into another, from one part of being into another. And these must be the oars. And these, to me, are the figures working the oars on the boat and making it move. I just, it's such a great image. The colors. Less interpretation. <laughs> but Margo? I said less room for interpretation. You get a definitive sense right. of. You get a sense of a thing, people and things in this image. And again, for me, it has that kind of glorious, almost, I don't know, happy, but almost joyous feeling. All right. That is signature on the upper left. I believe this has more to do with the poet or the myth up here. There is a date, but I don't think it's a signature. 
I think it has to do more with the title of the, or the series that this is part of. Okay. <clears throat> I could be wrong. This could say CT here for Cy Twombly, but I, I'm not sure what this says. All my researchers out there, you could start digging. This is one of his more famous, I think, but I'm not sure. Okay. So today, if you have paint, start laying out your palette. If you want to work in oil pastel or soft pastel, markers, crayons, you could do colored pencils, you could do mixed media for this piece. But my recommendation today is to limit your media. And I have made this declaration before, and I, it bears repeating. Teaching abstraction is one of the most difficult things I do. There are so many different directions that you can go in with abstraction. My recommendation for you, if you choose to do an abstraction today, is to limit your choices. So in other words, I would limit your palette. For example, stick to a family of colors. You might want to stick with the blue-greens or the red-yellows with a touch of green, perhaps, or a touch of blue, if you're using the red yellows, one odd color that you use just a tiny bit of. Limit the types of shapes you use. Limit yourself to either geometric or abstract, or just think about lines. But to try and do everything in abstraction, you're just going to get frustrated. Does everybody understand so far? Please start asking questions. Any questions? All questions are good. I recommend if you have it to work and if you have the space to do it, that you work on large paper. Let your arm be loose, particularly if you're using paint. Try not to overthink what you're doing, but do try and think about which colors are going to work well with each other, which shapes are going to work well together, and really think about your composition. Think about how Twombly use corners, how sometimes the composition started in the bottom right and worked its way to the left, or vice versa, started in the upper left and worked its way down to the right, lower right. That's what creates an interesting experience for the viewer of abstract art. Try and have your lines and shapes relate to each other in some way, either through color or by touching each other. It's very difficult in abstraction to just let things float loosely around. Even Twombly in some of the imagery, like the first picture we looked at, even though the shapes were for the most part separate, they related to each other through color. There was a lot of red and ochre in that picture. So they had a relationship to each other through color, even though they weren't touching. They related to each other in size. For the most part, they were small, except in areas of the image where he wanted the viewer to focus, like that funny, red shape that was protruding from the right. It was large and solid compared to a lot of the other shapes in the picture. If you want to start with a figurative form, 
but make it loose and abstract if that helps you get started or if you have a poem in mind with imagery that you want to start working from that will help you as well any questions this is a lot to think about today when I work in this kind of work, I do not start by drawing a pencil sketch first, but if you feel that you need to do that, have at it. Nothing wrong with working out your composition in pencil first. In fact, it's a really good idea for organizing your composition. And in abstraction, there's nothing wrong with covering up. If you don't like part of a picture, you can paint over it. You can collage over it. You can erase, Twombly erased all the time. And erasure can include covering over something with a different color or scraping it off with a palette knife or a butter knife, depending on the surface you're painting on. If it's heavyweight paper, you can always scrape away what you don't like or rub it off with a paper towel. All right, you guys are all good. Teresa, Suzanne, Susan, Stephanie, Mika, Margo, Jane, France May, you all ready to get going? I'm getting a thumbs up from Suzanne, awesome. Yay, Franz May, you're ready. Teresa, I can see you're working. Susan, looks like you're deep, deep, deep in concentration. Jane, go for it. And Stephanie, I don't know. <laughs> Stephanie, you're off camera. That's fine. All right. I am going to work in acrylics today. I might use watercolor as well. Not sure. So I'm going to start laying out my palette. on the easel today. I think I'm going to limit myself to the three primaries and white and black. And I'm probably going to move towards the earth tones because they're my favorite.
Remember to think of your background as part of your composition. You could use it as a solid color. You might want to leave it white. But it is part of your background. Mute, everybody. Thank you. Nice music, but some people might not want it. Low on white
that. So I'm going to start with big brushes first. And big inspiration for me is Australian Aboriginal art, as I mentioned repeatedly. Um, so I think I'm going to work in that vein today. Start mixing some earth tones. I'm just going to start by laying down some big color areas first, and then take it from there. Keeping it loose. Now I'm 
going to start tightening it up. Tinier brush. So against my dark shape, I'm doing some work with dots and drips. Now I'm going to start doing some black details. where that takes me.
go back to my big brush. Black was a bit heavy, I think. So I'm, my form of erasure is now putting white over my black. It's starting to have kind of an animal form to it. Not intentional.
you get to a stage in abstraction where things just start evolving and you can go with the flow, so to speak. It's almost a process of letting go of control, but then taking control. actually feeling like mine might be done. So I'm gonna sit down for a few minutes. And let it percolate. What you guys are doing. Anybody have any questions? Nope, we're, do we're doing okay. You can always put questions in the chat box too, don't forget. And you still have over half an hour.
Um, I have been invited to read a poem. Let me see. The run upstairs. I might have a folder here. Hold on. One minute. That certainly would be appropriate for this month of poetry. a few poems. Here is a poem called The First Day of Spring. The first day of spring itches. Oh, I believe I've read, I read this to my Tuesday class, but it's worth reading again. The first day of spring itches because an emerald blade of grass is pushing out of my forehead. I've become a unicorn. And here's Carl Sandburg, Fog. The fog comes on little cat feet. It sits looking over harbor and city on silent haunches and then moves on. Here's a poem, I don't have the author, a simile for her smile. Your smiling or the hope, the thought of it, makes in my mind such pause and abrupt ease as when the highway bridge gates fall, balking the hasty traffic, which must sit on each side, masked and staring, while deliberately the drawbridge starts to rise, then horns are hushed, the oil smoke rarefies above the idling motors. One can tell the packet's smooth approach the slip, slip of the silken river past the sides, the ringing of clear bells, the dip and slow cascading of the paddle wheel. Here is a poem by Emma Guest called Friendship. A friend is like a flower, a rose to be exact, or maybe like a brand new gate that never Come unlatched, a friend is like an owl, both beautiful and wise, or perhaps a friend is like a ghost whose spirit never dies. A friend is like a heart that goes strong until the end. Where would we be in this world if we didn't have a friend? And here's one by Oscar Wilde. I think I'm gonna make this the last one. It's called A Vision. Two crowned kings and one that stood alone with no green weight of laurels round his head. But with sad eyes as one uncomforted 
and wearied with man's never ceasing moan for sins no bleeding victim can atone. And sweet long lips with tears and kisses fed. Girt was he in a garment black and red. And at his feet I marked a broken stone which sent up lilies dove-like to his knees. Now at their sight, my heart being lit with flame, I cried to Beatrice, who are these? And she made answer, knowing well each name. Eskylos first, the second Sophocles, and last, wide stream of tears, Euripides. There are many, many poems out there. Who is that one again? That one was by Oscar Wilde. A riff on Dante. Aha, you are so literate. Thank you. Stephanie, go ahead, please. Stephanie. I'll send it to you. I like, I think you should read it. I would be honored. Let's see if it came through. Are you gonna send it in the chat? Yeah, see if it came through. Yeah, it did actually. Um, I am not a poet either, but I'm not seeing, the, wait. Scroll. Yeah, that's, it's not the whole thing. No? It, it looks like it went through. Hmm. So either I am not technologically able. Oh. Do you want me to read it? Yes, go ahead and read it, please. Okay. We would love that. It's okay. your poem, you should read it. Okay, um, okay. Go ahead. I'm not a poet either. I'm not a poet either. I'm an artist, or am I not that either? Dabbling in art off and on, pastel oils watercolor pencil an adventure of course to see who shall see what i've done off and on for years i'm not a poet i'm not an artist either i'm a gardener of orchids that's all been down the green road but i do the best with orchids on my desk on the chest of drawers on the table in the living room there are two tables in the living room, new leaves, new spikes, new buds, new flowers. The small ones need only one ice cube, the medium ones two, the largest three. I'm not a poet, I'm not an artist. I'm not a gardener either. I'm a grandmother, such joy, a teenager breathes life into me. I'm a poet, I'm an artist, I'm a gardener, I'm a grandmother. Wonderful. Thank you. That was so cool. Thank you. Bravo. Oh, you got a lot of hand claps. Oh, thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you. Well done. You are all those things. And more probably. Yes. Rolled into one great person. Thank you. Thank you for sharing with us. Anyone else have a poem? I have invited you to bring poems. It appears that many of you are busy with your paintings. We're gonna share in another 10 minutes. I think my piece is complete. I don't really want to do more to it. It looks like a porcupine. It does have an animal quality to it. 
I'm not. Yeah. I'm not going to fight it. Does it have a title? No. <laughs> oh, by the way, my eyes are much better. Oh, good, Stephanie. Thank you for letting us know. Stephanie was having problems. Always a tragedy when I hear about an artist having eye problems. Oh, terrible. Congratulations. That's great news. Yep. So this for me as a teacher is the frustrating time because I can't really see what you're making to give you suggestions, but you all look contented. And busy. Remember to pull together the different divergent parts of your abstraction. Try and make the colors, shapes, lines all work together. That is the tricky part. That's the part that I cannot really teach you. That comes through experience, the actual doing of abstraction. That's why it's one of the more difficult genre of art to teach. The kind of art that looks like children's scribbles <laughs> is really the hardest form of art to teach. Because that has to come from within. So, so much of it does come from within. It's, it's a very intellectual pursuit. Even though it looks easy, that's deceptive. It's, yeah, it's very difficult. There are so many levels to it. And I spoke over you, Stephanie. Did you have more you wanted to add to that? Oh, no, 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 no. Elizabeth, did you grow up in Brooklyn? No. Oh, okay. No, I I grew up, um, I was born in Ossining, New York. I spent the first seven years of my life in Croton on the Hudson. Oh, nice. And then moved to Mars Plains and spent my childhood in Mars Plains, New Jersey went to college in New Jersey, then went to graduate school in California, and then went to Australia. Oh, really? For seven years and then came back and ended up in Hoboken. That's a good place to end up. Yes. And I've been here for over 40 years. That's how good it is. Uh, yeah. I have not been able to stray far from water in my life, particularly yeah. the Hudson River. I, I live right on the Hudson, so it's really wonderful. Yeah, you're in a great location. Yeah, I love it here. I have a deep and abiding love for the Hudson, maybe because I was born right on. No, I lived in Hawaii for a, about a year and a half. Lucky you. It was okay. <laughs> the island? I lived on the island of Kauai. It's beautiful. So I went from the Garden Isle to the Garden State. Uh -huh. Yep. I love it. And that's why you're a gardener. 
Oh, I only grow orchids in the house. So I have one that's so crazy. You have to see this. I can hold it up. Can you see how it's growing? It's growing. One stalk is so down and one stalk is standing up. Oh my God, it's great. Look at the color. It's gorgeous. I know. Isn't that gorgeous? But I can't get this one to go to go up. So it's kind of like weird. I, I never saw one do that before. I think weird is what makes it so beautiful. <laughs> I agree. It's crazy. And you have to have a green thumb to be successful with orchids. So kudos. Good for Well, you. as I said, I learned um, ice cubes. That's what does it. My sister, who also has a gift with orchids, just taught me that. And I, she gave me an enormous orchid for my last birthday, my latest birthday. And so far, the ice cubes are doing yep. the trick. Yep. Two a week, she said. Depends on the size of the pot. It's pretty big as orchids go, so like this big. Wow. I usually buy the cheap ones at Walmart or Trader Joe's. Yeah, I think she splurged on this. I'm sure she did. So oh, four more minutes, everybody. I'm going to put in the chat our artist for next week. We are going completely in the opposite direction. We are looking at one of the great masters of European art. Maybe I should Look for a poem by Virgil, since he was such a big influence on our artist, Cy Twombly. Let's see if I can find something. from the Aeneid. Here is one of his most famous passages from the Aeneid. Easy is the descent to a vernus, for the door to the underworld lies open both day and night. But to retrace your steps and return to the breezes above, that's the task, that's the toil. Not very uplifting, is it? No. Huh. 
Passage from Ninety nine famous quotes by Virgil. Here's a great Virgil quote to end with Fortune sides with him who dares. Or if I cannot move heaven, I will raise hell. <laughs> ah, right. And with that, I'm going to announce that it's time to stop and tell you our artist for next week is Titian. And I have chosen Titian because he was inspired by the poet Ovid. And we will talk more about him next week. But now I would like to see if there are people who want to share what they've created today. Suzanne, you are first in my lineup. And you're holding up your work already. Let's put you in the spotlight. I don't know. Can you see? I can't tell. Yeah, you have a bit of glare from the window behind. Ooh, look at all the snow up where you are. Yeah. Oh, yeah, this is better. So what I was trying to do was I was ab trying abstracting. I was inspired by that red, red ochre kind of flower shape. And so I was playing with that and planes intersecting. Beautiful. I like this, this very strong diagonal of the branch from the bottom corner right across the whole composition. Really awesome. <coughs> the one suggestion I might make, and I love your color choices, the dark rectangle in the upper right, I would maybe, I would Expand the foliage flower. Okay. Yeah. Into that? Yeah. And even on the bottom over the brown area as well. I would. Where on the bottom where Liz? Your left, your left hand side. Oh, here. No, that's your no, right. That's one. your right. Here? Oh, here. Yeah, on this whole side of the picture, I would put more of the foliage. Okay, okay. Yeah, I would make it more organic over these strong rectangular forms. Okay, okay, we'll yeah. do Okay, thank you. Very nice. All right, and you got some thumbs up. Stephanie, you're next. Yeah, you can always use the thumbs up icon in the reactions box in your Zoom to react to people's work. How beautiful, too. Look at this. Suzanne and now Stephanie are our color queens today. Gorgeous. Thank you. I like the dark lines and shadows really pull the bright colors together. This is great. And it's just enough dark. I might add, 
I don't know if you can see where my cursor is. You're talking about down here, probably. No, exactly opposite that. Here? Yeah. To the left of this yellow stem, just maybe one more, but under this pink curve. Underneath the pink curve, closer to the yellow stem, just a dash more of black. Okay. No, not 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 there on the other opposite side, but yeah. underneath this pink curve. You're on top of the pink curve, underneath. Yeah. Send me the JPEG and I and I can and I can tell you more. Okay. But I like the squiggly quality of the dark lines too. That's awesome. Okay. Awesome. Lovely. I have one more that I did. Oh, you did more than one. Yeah. I did a lot because they, they just came real fast. So I did. Oh, this. how cool. Wow. Oh. Love Ooh. the color. Yeah, I like this kind of rectangular form. So Fabulous. That's unusual and unexpected. Thank Which you. is your favorite? Which one? Yeah, of the three. I don't know. I, I, of the trees, I think probably this one because it's mm. just unusual. Mm. But I did it on this flimsy paper, so I'm not too happy with that. But. Mm, just beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> I should do more um, abstracts because uh, <laughs> they're I fun. It's another one. Yeah. Wow. These are great. Thank you. Yeah. Fun. You have a nice line quality to your work, Stephanie. Very strong. Thank you for sharing, both You're Suzanne welcome. and Thank you. Stephanie. Great work. Thank you. All right, Margot. Oh. <laughs> I started out doing abstract, but then went into a long yeah, Margo, you got to activate your camera so I can put you on spotlight. Oh, <laughs> oh there we go. Focusing on, can you see? Because my the lighting here is kind of crappy. Yep. Oh, that's cool. Isn't that a hell of a tarot card? Hmm? So does <laughs> this come from a myth or a story? We have pentacles. I don't know. You see the oh, reference? The queen of the pentacle. Oh, so it's a tarot card. Yes. Exactly. Love it. The uh, things around the edge are abstract. I tried to keep the uh, foliage abstract. <laughs> I want the the foreground is so beautifully done. I want something in the background behind her mm -hmm. chair and behind the mountain because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. she is lost in all this empty space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see that you filled it in with yellow, but I think it has to be something slightly darker. Maybe that's what it is. Okay. Got it. Okay. Yeah. I wanted gold, but I didn't have any gold paint. <laughs> yeah, maybe some shading behind her chair might do the trick. Okay. Well, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Attention to oh, detail is great, Margo. Thanks. Terrific. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. And Mika. You can't see you. Mm. <laughs> you have to move your camera down. Mika, yeah, you got it. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Wow. Mm. Oh. Wow. Mm. Oh. It's, oh, and it's love. still dripping. It's still dripping. Yes. It's <laughs> dripping. <laughs> Oh, and I love, I love these dark drips. I hope you do too. No, no, we're going to stop it up. Because is this kind of work hard for you to do? Put it down, put it down so it stops dripping. Is it difficult for you to do this kind of work? No, not too difficult. Not. I, don't, I don't have to care. <laughs> I don't have to oh. escape, so <laughs> I can relax. <be> <laughs> so it's a release for you. Uh -huh. Yeah, really, really. Very 
So for those of you who don't know Mika, her work is usually very controlled, right? Mm -hmm. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful colors, Mika. Yes. It's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. okay. It's stunning. <laughs> no, it's what is acrylic, it? right? Is it acrylic? What is acrylic? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Is it gorgeous. finished or you're continuing to work on it? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe almost done. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Just beautiful. Thank you. Nika, are you using a brush, a sponge, or a cloth? Brush. Mm -hmm. Yay, got it. Beautiful. Thank mm -hmm. you. I like how you've left so much empty, too. That's <laughs> difficult for you, I think. Different. It's, I shouldn't say difficult. Different for you. Different. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mika. Gorgeous. All right, Franz May. Thank you for sharing, Mika. Thank you. Oh. oh, yeah. Oh, oh wow. Uh, so I got inspired by all the goddess. And so I try to find some from my country. So I choose uh, Jassi. She's uh, uh, the goddess of the night. And she also protects the lovers. Mm. So she, she causes something that we call saudade, which is, is the feeling of missing someone. Mm. So she make like the warriors miss home. So they come back soon to their houses. Um, so I try to do like the flowers, get inspired by the artists that we saw today. Um, also the lettering, so because it got lost with everything, I put this one forward. Um, and it's the first time I do like dripping, I don't know what I was doing, but it was very fun. That's it was, a wonder, it's wonderful. beautiful, beautiful, really lovely, beautiful. beautiful. It's finished, mm -hmm. it's finished, it's great. Do you want to remind folks where you're from? so that they can relate. Uh, I, am, I am from Brazil. Ah, so okay. Usually, oh. I, when we see culture, I try to bring back some of mine so I can Thank you. To Thank go you. to home and also show you also, because I always get so inspired by all the artists, mm. everything that I have never seen. So I try to bring a little bit so maybe I can inspire you too. <laughs> mm, beautiful. Thank you, thank you, you Franz, man. Thank you. Obrigado. Lovely. Obrigado. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's gorgeous colors and the dripping really works in this one. Fabulous. Mm -hmm. Well done. Thank you for sharing. All right, Susan, you're up next. I didn't want to use paint today because I um, I don't like to paint on my couch. So I just started using some uh, oil-based, you know, cray pot. Cray pots, yeah. Mm. Great. And there's my... <laughs> Which particular ethnography were you referring to? Or is it a mix? I, I just started drawing, but it looks like Miro to me. <laughs> <laughs> it does remind me of Miro, and it has a Native American. Yeah, like Coco Pelli. Yeah. Coco yeah, Pelli. that's Coco Pelli. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Love the yeah. colors. Love the <laughs> colors. I would get a little darker in the background around the forms. Okay. Okay. That I just have fun with it. I just started drawing. You oh, know, it's, beautiful. it's beautiful. It's <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> but get a little darker around the shapes. It will pull your composition together. Unite. Okay. It will unite these great shapes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I love that, it. I, just, I had some fun with it. I couldn't really, I, I don't know. It just came from my subconscious. So. <laughs> That's where all our art comes from. Mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome, Susan. Great. Thank Thanks. You. Jane, you are up, and I believe you're last. Unless maybe Laura, you did something. 
Oh. Hello. Jane, what did you create? So I, I love what you said, Liz, about this, you know, the abstract process of letting go and then being decisive as well. I forget what you said. I should have, well, it's in the recording. I'll go back and listen. Um, so today I work oh well. God, I really you're not writing down my every word. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so today I uh, really enjoyed the, the lesson and your comments and just want to say what, how much I appreciate what I have learned from you. Thank you. And how it's allowing me to explore creativity in my life, which, you know, has been um, kind of the back burner for so long. So today I right chose, you. sorry. Right back at you. Your comments help all of us. So thank you so much. Yeah. So today I chose to work on and almost finish some of the um Confine, the confinement clause that I had uh -huh. shown you a couple of weeks ago. And I'm working on the, on the Liz theme of- um, Oh, earth tones. Earth tones. So this is what, these are the ones that I have produced today. They're almost done. And uh, I'll bring some uh, on Tuesday so you can choose some for yourself. Oh, thank you so much. I'm thinking so, of insulation. My gosh, you could put multiples of these on a wall and you have a sculpture. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah. So I had fun with that. I had pinned, I had cut them and pinned them a few days ago. And then I said, today's the day. I don't feel like starting something new. And this feels very good to progress with these. So thank you. Can you, what are they? she doesn't know what they are, so let her know. Fill her in. Who was asking? Stephanie, yeah. I don't think she heard oh, hey, Stephanie. last week. So in 2020, when we were all, uh, you know, finding ourselves locked down and there was a young woman who started doing painted lids on jars and, you know, people were just doing things at home that, that they felt like doing. So. I started making these um, claws. They're on the one, one side. It's terry, terry cloth. So old, old, uh, re upcycled terry. And on the other side is just um, calicos and other fabrics. And I originally made them to be face cloths, um, but I realized that they work really well as sponges in the kitchen. And there's a kind of an echo. Um, aspect as well because celluloid and oh, those you know polyester sponges are do no good for the environment these can just be thrown right in the washing okay. machine and they come out looking wonderful again so so Liz yeah. is going to be my next test case um, I've sent some to New York to France to um, a number of places, and Liz is going to be the Hoboken test case. You'll let me know how they hold up. I'm all for eco friendly product. So, thank you so much for your creativity. And a fellow artist and member of our class, Lily, has given me this fabulous book called Threads for Life. See if you can find it. The Hoboken Public Library may have it. I'm forgetting the name of the author, but it is the history of civilization through the story of sewing. And it doesn't sound like it would be an exciting read, but it is incredibly exciting book to read, all about how sewing has been used for all kinds of reasons through the course of history. I'm loving it. Yeah, and I think that sewing has like some there is a connection between sewing and painting and creating. It's North just point. that it doesn't get it doesn't get quite the same attention. But I I can enjoy the feeling of sewing and preparing and thinking about how I want fabric to move. And it's it's not that different from it's uh, creating thanks. with other 
Yes. Yeah. It's yeah. just a different media. It is a right yeah. brain activity that uses right. your creative brain. It's yeah. Exactly and I, I totally, I'm a worshiper of fabric. Like I have rarely met a fabric oh. that I didn't have a, an emotion about. So awesome. Me too. Me too. <laughs> awesome. So on that bright note, thank you so much, Jane and everyone. Oh, Teresa. Teresa, do you want to share? Yeah. Yikes. No. <laughs> um, as usual, I love the process, not so much the result. Oh, Teresa, please. Well, all right, hold on. Um, I was working from um, Dylan Thomas's poem, Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night. Yes. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. So this is oh my the, gosh, this is gorgeous. <laughs> well, thank you. It's the first time I ever tried oil pastel, so I was playing with them. Oh, it's I fantastic. love it. It's gorgeous. I love the colors. I oh. love compositionally starting from the top and exploding mm -hmm. outwards like that. It's great, Teresa. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to enjoy the process. Gorgeous. Look at, he's got a lot of hearts and clapping hands going there for you. So, looks like Klimt to me. Like Gustav Klimt. All Klimt. right. I thought the same thing. It looked like Klimt. That's beautiful. It's gorgeous. That's gorgeous. high praise. That is. That is. And Teresa, I'm so glad you're here today. Teresa is a full time teacher, so she doesn't always get the opportunity to be with us. So, Always, always grateful when you can join us. Really am. Thank you. All right, everyone, with that high note, I'm going to say goodbye till next week. Start looking at the works of Titian and enjoy the rest of this week. Keep making your wonderful art, art on everybody. And April is still with us. So keep reading poetry. Thank you, Hoboken Library, and see you all soon. Take care. Be safe. Bye. Bye, Thank everyone. You. Bye.